I've been a critic of capitalism uh, most of my adult life. Uh, I didn't start out that way, but one of the things that really shook me up was when I was a graduate student working on my doctoral dissertation at Yale, I did as many graduate students. Uh, I needed money because it's expensive to write a dissertation, you don't earn anything. And so I went to work for a professor who had a research grant, very typical at Yale, and who could give me a part of that grant to do some of the research that he needed. And this particular professor, whose name I will not mention because you may have heard of him, um, he was doing a study of housing. And like many Yale professors, New Haven was always a convenient place to be because you used the community more or less as guinea pigs. Uh, you could get a grant to study New Haven. New Haven didn't get any money, but you got a lot of money from Washington to study New Haven. And I was on one of those grants. And he studied housing, and so I went to work on the housing problem here in New Haven in those years, as back in the 19, late 1960s. And in the course of that, I studied housing, and I studied Yale, and I studied Yale's assets and Yale's housing purchases. And as a naive kid, I was aghast. Because what I was studying and making little reports and bringing to my professor was basically revealing to me a university that was ripping off the community big time. Not paying taxes, but providing other kinds of inducements, that's a polite word for bribes, inducements to get streets rearranged and space opened up and zoning laws suspended and all of the apparatus that is normal business at Yale. Uh, and it was horrifying. It was when I learned that New Haven was finally becoming one of the ten poorest cities in the United States, which it was for most of these years. Yale proudly explaining to me, since I was one of the few people who ever read the financial statements of Yale, um, that it really was the third or fourth richest university on the planet. And so I watched why the, while the city that was the tenth poorest was subsidizing delivery services without a charge to the third or fourth richest university in the world. And I remember once telling this to a friend who giggled and said, yes, yes, it's Robin Hood in reverse. And I then used that slogan for the rest of my life because I thought it encapsulated really well uh, what happened. So I've been a critic of a system that allows this to happen uh, ceaselessly. And not just Yale, of course, the same thing is true in many other places, although Yale is a little more egregious in this behavior <laughs> even than other schools. Um, when I sat on the New Haven Revenue Commission in the early 1980s, an official commission here in New Haven, as some of you may remember, the only time in the history of New Haven I believe that this existed, the Board of Aldermen passed a, a, a rule, set up a commission. The commission was given a budget, if I remember, $40,000, which in those years was some money and subpoena power to force testimony of anybody we chose to, to order. And we really did the only study of the relationship between Yale and the city financial study. And the AFL-CIO was given one position on this commission. And I got the nod. That is, I can't remember who was the head of the board at that time. But whoever it was put me on the, on the board as the uh, representative of the and since I was the only economist, it was then nice because I was able to slowly work on the other members of the commission so that by the time it was done, it took about two years, the other members of the commission and I were unanimous but for one person. Uh, Wigan and Dana had a, representative, <laughs> had a representative on the board, a man named Eisner. Uh, and he, of course, was the mouthpiece for Yale, which was understood. That's why the position was created. But we all voted against him. He was the only one left. And by that time of the commission's report, the idea that Yale had to fundamentally change its relationship and pay money to New Haven, as it should have done for 300 years, was supported by every single person except the paid mouthpiece of Yale. And it included among those aldermen, some of you will remember these names, Jonathan Einhorn, um, trying to think who else, someone help me. A whole bunch of people who had been important in New Haven politics, uh, all of whom understood this issue. And we delivered this report with great gusto to the then mayor, Biagio Delito, who promptly forgot it, buried it, and paid no attention to it. Um, and that was because Yale had gotten to him. He was always a loyal uh, doer of Yale's biz bil bidding. But that didn't distinguish him from most of the mayors of New Haven who had a long tradition 
of doing that, and uh, the current one is no exception. Okay. Um, so, much, so much for that. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the economic crisis. Uh, and actually, let me make one more little personal thing. Stephen because Warwick. What? Wasn't Stephen Warwick one of the people in the community? Stephen Warwick, that's right. Stephen Warwick, who at one point was a candidate for Congress from New Haven. Mm -hmm. That's right, and who, who, whose family owned the Cooley Chevrolet dealership in this area. When I ran for office in New Haven, one of the things that prevented me from continuing to run and I at least had a good curve, right? When I ran for mayor, I got 10%. When I ran for alderman two years later, 46. Looked pretty good. That is, the direction was the right. But, and I don't, I'm not proud of this. I can't actually regret it. My encounter with the political life of New Haven at that level, when I met all the aldermen and I sat on that commission, was traumatic for me personally. I was a naive kid. I thought politics was about what one wanted to see in the community, what changes one thought were necessary, what new possibilities one could open for a community of people. I actually took that stuff seriously. Mm -hmm. The other men and women, who were fine people, were on the board of aldermen or in politics because it was part of their careers. They had a plumbing business and they needed contracts. They were the distributors of toilet paper, and they saw contracts coming if they were good politicians. They, they, they had no idea, and to talk to them would be as if I was going to have a conversation where they spoke English and I spoke a dialect of Urdu. <laughs> that is, we wouldn't communicate real well because we lived in different universes, and I couldn't see in those years how I could possibly function. I would be an irritant to them, they would be an irritant to me. We'd get on each other's nerves, and where would this go? Now, that may have been a mistake. Sometimes I really do think so, but I did that, then decide to step back, although there were other people. Fortunately, Matt Bornstein, some of you know, was very active and leader of the teachers' union in New Haven who did carry on and run for mayor a couple of years later. Um, we did prove, by the way, that a Green Party could get a solid political base. When I ran, and again when Matt ran, there were about a third of the wards in New Haven where the Green Party for mayor came in second, beat the Republican Party. So uh, all kinds of independent politics are possible in our community. It depends more upon whether the people like you do it than on anything else. Okay. This film that you saw was made before a live audience at Smith College up in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, in November of 2008. So keep that in mind. Some of the things in there are references that are dated by that fact. <clears throat> it took a few months to make the film from the time it was filmed, and it was released in February of this year. So just as a reference point for some of the things you may have noticed in there. Where are we now? Nothing fundamentally in that film I would take back. Everything that's in there, I feel vindicated in almost everything that I have said. There may be a couple of areas where I'm going to speak in a minute where I would adjust things because time has passed, events have happened. First, though, about the crisis and whether the crisis is severe and whether the crisis is continuing. And this is very important now because you've had an unprecedented an extremely dangerous um, series of statements over the last three months about green shoots or recovery or where the recession is behind us or Bernanke has said it, uh, Larry Summers, the chief economic advisor to Obama has said it, Obama himself has said it, and so on. What is going on? Well, first the reality on the ground. This recession it's now called, by the way, the Great Recession. That's the concession. It's not the Great Depression, but you acknowledge how bad it is by giving it a new name, the Great Recession. The Great Recession is said to have started by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the official agency that times these things, gives them their dates, to have begun in December of 2007. 